Welcome everybody to our weekly discussion about the Book of Mormon. Again, this is not a Sunday school class or a priesthood or relief society class. This is a class where we're discussing the context and content of the Book of Mormon. This week's curriculum for Come Follow Me is chapters 1 through 4 of Jacob. If I can just say there's a couple things really interesting about this. Uh, Jacob may be my favorite writer in the Book of Mormon. Uh, he is phenomenal. Um, we'll do a little bit to review about him. But to start, I, I want to bring up a word. I was discussing with a colleague of mine on the word presentism, which means where you judge the past by the values and the norms of the present. In other words, do we go into ancient Egypt and say those are false gods, so we need to rip down the pyramids and all other things there? No, that's kind of foolish. We use them as historical uh, artifacts and historical sites. Uh, but we see the same, same thing going on all over the country right now is where we're taking things from the Civil War and we say well, we need to destroy that or rip it down because it was wrong. Well, we can do the same thing with scriptures. We can take the year 2020 perspective and lens and zoom in on what something wrote in Joseph Smith's day or back in the days of the Book of Mormon. And it's really not a fair way to judge or present value on, on something. So we'll mention that a couple of times as we talk today. I want to be careful with that. But Jacob is going to discuss things in his day through his lens that are really the same things that we face today here in America and throughout the world. He talks about anxiety, the love of money, neglecting the poor, socialism versus capitalism, racism, immorality, uh, the racial and social classes, hardening of our hearts, pride, and many other topics. And that's just all in the first three or four chapters here. So let's get started. Now, this is a slide from a previous week where we first introduced Jacob as a writer in the Book of Mormon. Just to recap quickly here, he was first mentioned in chapter 18 of 1 Nephi. He was born in the wilderness, uh, and he grieved along with his uh, parents because of the actions of Laman and, and Lemuel. We also know from 2 Nephi chapter 2 that his blessing by his father was given upon his head, and he will receive the same blessings of Nephi. We also learn that he leave the land of, left the, left the land of first inheritance at the same time that Nephi did. We also know from 2 Nephi chapter 5 that he was consecrated a priest and a teacher by his, uh, by his older brother. We also know that chapter 6 was the first time he really sat down and, and his record is included in the current uh, Book of Mormon, which is a phenomenal chapter to read. So now we know a little bit about that. I, I want you to just also pay close attention to that Nephi gives Jacob the record and wants him to be the historical and spiritual leader, but not the political leader. Now, that this is interesting because most fathers would want their sons to do that. Now, we know Nephi has kids because he talks about them. But in this case, just like Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith's, the, the spiritual line of authority won't go through Joseph Smith's kids. It'll go through his brother's kids. I see a parallel between Joseph and, and, uh, and Nephi in that case. So let's move on and start. If you'll open up your scriptures to Jacob chapter 1, we'll take a look at a few things here. Again, we're here to review some historical context and some of the content in the scriptures here. Use your Come Follow Me book to pull out some of the more spiritual things and, and applications for you. Jacob chapter 1, verse 1. We know because of this verse... Jacob can't be older than 55 years at the time of this writing. But we know he has to be older than 48 years because eight years in the wilderness. So he's probably somewhere in his early 50s. We also know that he also has a younger brother born in the wilderness, Joseph, and, so, and sisters. So there's multiple children born during that uh, eight-year window. So he's probably somewhere in his early 50s. Now, if you go to verse 2, and this is all in Jacob chapter 1, verse 2, 
he does something really interesting here. He wants to make sure that what he's writing about is focusing on the Savior. So he's taken that same charge that Nephi did. Nephi says, we're writing nothing unless it touches on the Savior Jesus Christ. So when, when Nephi wrote about the broken bow, it's because he wants to teach us something about the Savior. So when Jacob writes anything in here, the reason he put it in there is because he feels like it will teach us something about the Savior. Otherwise, as verse 3 says, he's going to keep his history on other plates. There's a whole other record for that. Now, we already touched on verse 9, where the new king will be called Nephi, but it's not going to be Jacob. Jacob has a whole other purpose in there. So, let's go to verse 13 and 14 for a moment. We look at this often as that there's all kinds of ites, Nephites, Jacobites, Lamanites. Well, it's pretty interesting. If you ask, if someone asks me, where am I from? I give a different answer based upon who I'm talking with. If I were over in Europe and someone says, hey, where are you from? I'd say, I'm, a, I'm from America. If I were back in California and someone says, hey, where are you from? I'd say, oh, I'm from Kentucky. If somebody here in Kentucky asked me where I, where I lived, depends on what part of the state I'm at, the closer I get I get to my home, the more detailed I give them. Well, if I, I, I say I'm from Lexington, but I really don't even live in Lexington. I live further out. I'm in the Georgetown ward and so forth. So if you look here, why does Jacob make a difference between all of these different places? But he says he's just going to call them Nephites. Well, for you and I, it doesn't really make any difference. We're so far out that by the time we zoom in, they're just Nephites and Lamanites. Really interesting point there in those couple of verses. So let's go to verse 19 for a moment. Here is something that Nephi says. Uh, verse 19, And we did magnify our office unto the Lord, taking upon us the responsibility, answering the sins of the people upon our heads, if we did not teach them the word of God with all diligence. Now, when I've read this so many times, I keep thinking, why is Jacob so concerned about him? In other words, he several times says, you know what? I'm, I'm going to teach you because I don't want your sins upon me. And he mentions that if you go further in the verse. That our, uh, by laboring with our might, their blood might not come upon our garments. He's really concerned about him. And I thought, is this a selfish thing that the only reason he's teaching his people or he just wants to emphasize them? I, I've really been spending some time thinking about this. And then 2 Nephi chapter 4, verse 6 comes out. He notices that Lehi over and over and over condemns Laman and Lemuel and even tells their kids, kids, your sins are not going to be up on your heads. It's going to be all in your parents' heads. So Jacob's brought up with this belief, this thought, this mentality that your responsibility as a leader is to teach the next generation. And if you don't, it's on your head. It's on your shoulders. So Jacob reiterates this and repeats this multiple times, letting people know that I am teaching you because I love you. And notice it's focusing on Christ. But he mentions over and over, the sins will be upon you, not upon me, because I'm doing my duty. Whereas for Laman and Lemuel, again, if we look at it through Laman's, excuse me, uh, Jacob's time frame, he's only a few years off from Laman and Lemuel are over there, and those kids are doing things that are not correct, and it's not their fault. It's their parents' fault. So really interesting here. So let's go a little bit further and uh, take a look at some of the doctrines that Jacob's going to emphasize. One of them is he talks about the problem. So if you go to chapter 1 still, go to verse 15 and 16. And let's look for problems. He's identifying very specific problems. And say, do we see those same ones today? Verse 15. And now it came to pass that the people of Nephi, under the reign of the second king, began to grow hard in their hearts and indulge themselves somewhat in wicked practices such as, like unto David of old, desiring many wives and concubines, and also Solomon his son. 
Yea, and they also began to search much gold and silver and began to be lifted up somewhat in pride. Now, really interesting. Hearts are beginning to harden. Wicked practices. And is plural marriage the problem? The word in there that's really interesting is they desired many wives. That's a unique a unique phrase in there that I think is important to point out here. There's a love of money, and pride is the last word that we just uh, mentioned. All of those things we see today. So where does Jacob go to get the answer to solve some of his problems? Verse 17, Wherefore I, Jacob, gave unto them these words, as I taught them in the temple having first obtained my errand from the Lord. So let's talk a little bit about the temple. Now, in Jacob's day, they're doing what we know as Old Testament rituals, animal sacrifice and so forth. But he's clearly talking to men and women in the temple. So this is not like Moses' tabernacle, where it were only the priests offering the sacrifices. Here's a gathering of both men and women. And they're together and, and they're uh, learning. Now, granted, they still did what you and I would know as Old Testament practices. But it's obviously a building for teaching, learning, and training as well. So Jacob's in the temple. He's filling the Spirit, teach him what the solutions to these challenges are. And then, most importantly, he's now teaching them. So, what are some things that maybe you and I could do to keep the temple focused on us? Uh, keep our hearts in the temple. Keep the spirit of the temple. Well, we've been asked in, in years past, uh, have a picture of the temple in every room. Uh, my wife has created these little wooden plaques, and she put a picture of the temple, and she wrote the date that each of our kids uh, received their temple sealing when they were uh, sealed to us. And we have one in every kid's room. Plus, we have a larger picture of the temple in every room. Kind of a fun little way to focus on the temple. I currently live a over an hour away from a temple. We go often, but still it's nice to have that temple with us always. Uh, and it's nice to have a picture in our room. That's just one way. Can you think as a family other ways that you can have the temple in your home or a way to focus on the temple? Maybe have a family home evening lesson on the temple. It's fun to play matching game. Uh, pull up pictures. I'm sure there's all kinds of fun things on the internet you can find. Temple stats and uh, uh, purposes of the temple. Great things to do. Let's move on to our next topic, though. Go to Jacob chapter 2. We're going to look at verse 3 for a moment. Now, again, in verse 2, he says he goes into the temple. So he is inside the temple when he starts talking to these people. In verse 3, it's really interesting. He uses the word anxiety and how he's it. Again, we need to look at it through his lens. I, 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 am, I want to just clarify something here. I am not discrediting uh, clinical anxiety and depression. Let's set those aside for a moment. Uh, but anxiety, how he's using it is, he's anxious. So I asked one of my teenage daughters, I says, what does anxiety really mean? And her definition is, quote, really stressed out about little situations. Oh, that's an interesting answer. The dictionary says, a feeling of worry or nervousness or uneasy typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. The topical guide, when you look up that uh, cross-reference there, it says look up fearful. So how does the world combat anxiety, nervousness, uneasy, I'm just anxious, I'm so worried, I'm nervous. They might do it with medicines or breathing or... Uh, some other means. Jacob makes it very clear, though, of how to uh, overcome anxiety. And the whole focus, he says, is follow the word of the Lord and you'll be fine. Now, again, you go to somebody who's feeling anxiety or, as my daughter says, stressed out about the little situation. Again, I follow the word of the Lord. So let's take a look and see what some of the things that he's going to do to help them with this situation. Uh, if you go to verse 5 for a moment, he says, I can tell you concerning your thoughts. 
how that ye are beginning to labor in sin, which sin appeareth very abominable unto me. So can you really tell someone's thoughts that they're about to sin? How about a mom? How about a dad? Can they look at their teenagers and say, my kids are going the wrong direction. They're about to commit some grievous sins. I don't like the direction they're going. Maybe it's not rocket science. Maybe you can just observe. Maybe they did an extreme new hairdo or piercings. Or maybe they went and did something that screams that they're going a different direction than maybe they were before. Not that that's always bad. But I think you can tell, especially parents can, that their kids are going the wrong way. And Jacob's looking at his people and he says, I can tell concerning your thoughts. So what is their thing that he's going to do? Verse 7, it grieveth me that I must use so much boldness of speech concerning you. I mean, just a few years ago, Elder Holland in conference stands up and he says, why are we using so much boldness? And he tells the young men, because nothing else seems to work. Really interesting. But here's verse 8. Here's the solution to his anxiety and these problems. And it supposeth me that they, he's talking about the women, have come up hither into the temple to hear the pleasing word of God. Yea, the word which healeth the wounded soul. This would be... If I were teaching a Sunday school class, I would just read that one verse and I would say, how has the word of God healed your wounded soul? That's what you do in Sunday school, pre-student relief society. You share testimony because that you can't study out on your own. I can share my own, but I need to hear that from other people. But in this case, that is a point that he brings up. So we'll keep moving on here. Some great things here. Oh, and in verse 10, he tells them that he is speaking in the presence of the pure in heart and the broken heart. And he's speaking about the women who are inside of that temple there with him. At verse 11, right in the middle, uh, As I inquired of the Lord, thus came the word unto me, saying, Jacob, get thou up into the temple on the morrow, and I declare the word which I shall give thee unto this people. Beautiful things in there. So let's go on to the next topic. Let's go to uh, verse 12 is a good one to be a good place to begin with this one. And now behold my brethren, this is the word which I declare unto you. Remember he just received it from the Lord. Which I declare unto you that many of you have begun to search for gold and for silver and for all manner of precious ores in the which this land, which is a land of promise unto you, and to your seed doth abound most plentiful. Now, there is no sin in searching for gold and silver. There is no sin in being wealthy. Jesus never condemned the wealth. However, verse 13 is where the problem kicks in. And the hand of providence hath smiled upon you most pleasingly, that you have obtained many riches. Again, that's not the problem. And here's the key word. It's the because. Because some of you have obtained more abundantly than that of your brethren, ye are lifted up in the pride of your hearts. Again, the wealth isn't the problem here. The, the inequality might not even be the problem. But the inequality of the wealth causes some of them to be lifted up like, I make more money than you. I have more wealth than you. I have more wealth than you. Thus, we create an artificial sense of worth. Notice, I use the word worth deliberately there. The worth of a soul is great unto God, but the worth of a soul is not calculated based upon the financial stability or the financial situation of an individual. I want you to think about that for a moment. Some of them were lifted up, and why? He continues on, up in the pride of your hearts, and 
wears stiff necks, high heads because of the costliness of your apparel, and persecute, here's obviously a problem, persecute your brethren because ye suppose that ye are better than they. Again, it's that whole inequality and in wealth creates a superior person to the person who's poor, which is false. <coughs> Excuse me. And you can continue on in 14 and 15, uh, some wonderful things. But 16 is where it gets important. The purpose of the pride, or the result of it is, the, this pride of your hearts destroys your soul. And 18 and 19 is really the solution here. Before ye seek for riches, seek ye for the kingdom of God. And after ye have obtained a hope in Christ, ye shall obtain riches, if ye seek them. And then he tells you what you're going to do, them, uh, do with the riches. For the intent to do good, to clothe the naked, to feed the hungry, to liberate the captive, and administer relief to the sick and the afflicted. So I think here you can have a great uh, individual or family discussion. Do I have the resources to take care of my basic needs? Do I have shelter, food, clothing? And do I spend an excess on one of those items? Am I spending a significant portion of my income and wealth to help take care of those who are less fortunate? Or do they deserve it because they're poorer than I am? That same challenge is out here today. We are faced with the same thing. President Nelson, he's been a president of the church for two years now. And one of his major addresses was talking about this very same thing. Help the poor and the needy. So maybe you can have an evaluation. Do you have the resources and are you contributing significantly to help those in need? And if you don't know where or how to help, boy, go create an organization if you need to. A foundation. Donate fast offerings is a minimal uh, thing. Sometimes people ask me, how much should I donate? When I served as a bishop, I, I, I had people ask me. They say, I'm donating this percentage of my income. Is that significant? And I just smile and I say, hey, that's between you and the Lord, not me. And other people will say, oh, I'm donating X number of dollars. I knew someone who donated nothing but his Christmas bonus, which was significant. He's like, I figure that's my excess. I don't need it. I'm just giving that whole thing to the help the poor and the needy. However you do it, you can have some really interesting discussions as a family. As in, uh, and then most importantly in prayer, what would Heavenly Father have you do? But notice, his solution, service. Help the poor and the needy. Charity. Uh, charity is the Relief Society theme, motto, for a reason. It is the pure love of Christ. So you could have some great discussions. Maybe here, if I were in a Sunday school class, I might ask, how has somebody's charity been as if the Savior himself came and served? Or how have you been grateful because someone gave you an act of charity? It doesn't have to be, always be financial either. It might be an emotional or a spiritual. Great things. Let's go to the next topic. Jacob chapter 2, verse 23. But the word of God burdens me because of your grosser crimes. Like, those are bad, but now we're getting to the worse. <clears throat> Excuse me. The people begin to wax in iniquity. They understand not the scriptures, for they seek to excuse themselves in committing whoredoms because of the things which were written concerning David and Solomon his son. Behold, David and Solomon truly had many wives and concubines, which thing was abominable before me, saith the Lord. Now, I want to pause here for a moment, because some people can take that verse and say, plural marriage is wrong under all circumstances. But then you go read Doctrine and Covenants section 132, verse 38 and 39, and the Lord clearly says that Abraham, and it mentions David and Solomon, were all right in having plural wives. How can both be true? Again, we got to be careful that we're looking at it through the lens of who's speaking and in the time frame as he's speaking. Jacob was clearly commanded that at that time, in his people, that they were not to practice plural marriage. In fact, even says that the norm is one husband and one wife. And notice the real sin in there is they desired to sins, and they were, in verse 23, excusing themselves in committing whoredoms. In other words, 
they're rationalizing their sexual immorality because of what it says in the scriptures. We do the same thing today in our civilization. We will take something that somebody else says or thinks or believes and we'll rationalize it to, well, it's okay because this is what I want. This can be true in defining of a marriage today. If two people, well, if they love each other, then they should make a commitment to each other. That's what a marriage is. Well, that's not what the Lord says. So they're rationalizing one thought by excusing with what action they have, regardless of what their desires and natural wants and passions are. The Lord put very strict limits on certain things, and he's making it very clear. Marriage is between man and a woman. And in Jacob's time, as it is in our time, one husband, one wife, and that's the law. And anything else is excusing themselves to committing whoredoms, which things were written. Uh, really interesting in there. So maybe you could think of if, if there's a, a law today or a commandment today, and you can find a loophole, are you just excusing yourself to do something that you really want, or your desires, or your wishes, or your 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 appetites, or passions, or if you bridled them like the Lord has asked us to do? <clears throat> Let's take a look at uh, a couple more things with this one. Uh, verse 27. That one is specifically the law of marriage today. Wherefore, my brethren, hear me, and hearken to the word of the Lord. For there shall not any man among you, save it be one wife, and concubines he shall have none. For I, the Lord God, delight in the chastity of women. And whoredoms are an abomination before me, thus saith the Lord of hosts. Our prophets have reiterated that that is the standard for today as well. Anything outside of that standard is wrong and against the commandments today. Now, again, I'm not Abraham, and I'm not Joseph Smith. Those are two different times, two different lenses to look at. So we'll uh, we'll keep within our current time here. Uh and I really think it's interesting, of uh, chastity, he's speaking highly of. Boy, we live in a world today where it's all right. This is the world's belief, not the Lord's, the church's, or, or ours. But the world believes you can violate the law of chastity, or it's not even a violation if it's for love. Or even now, it's to the point where if it's mutually agreed upon, is it consensual? Is it recreational? Then it's okay as long as both parties agree to that. The Lord makes it very clear that that is not acceptable, even if we believe it is, or the world believes it is. Let's move on to our next topic. Let's go to Jacob 3. Jacob 3. How about verse 12? Jacob 3, verse 12. And now I, Jacob, spake many more things unto the people of Nephi, warning them against, again, fornication, lasciviousness, and every kind of sin, telling them the awful consequences of them. <coughs> Excuse me. I think it's important that we need to teach our children uh, all of the commandments and the consequences of them. But I think there's something that's even more important. Let's go to verse, excuse me, go to chapter 4 now, verse 1. What topic has been mentioned in general conference over and over and over and in the stake that I live in by our stake president over and over and over? Well, chapter 4, verse 1. Now behold, it came to pass that I, Jacob, having ministered much unto my people in word, and I cannot write but a little of my words because of the difficulty of engraving upon the plates and the engravings upon our plates. And we know that the things which we write upon the plates must remain. Verse 2, But whatsoever things we write upon, anything save it be upon plates, must perish and vanish away. Jacob knows what he's writing is going to be around a long time. Now, we don't have those exact plates. Remember, Mormon copied those onto his golden plates, and Joseph Smith translated from that. But it's interesting. Out of everything that Jacob's doing, goes back to verse 1. He's ministering. 
ministering. And I'll say it a third time. He's ministering to his people. He's fighting the evils of the world. Again, all of these topics that we are faced with today, how can we help people? We minister, uh, visit people, call people, text people, uh, warn them against the fornications and the crimes and the evils and the lusts. All those things, they just really won't matter in the future. And in the life to come, that's it. There's nothing except our relationships with our families. And verse 11, chapter 4, verse 11 says, Wherefore, beloved brethren, be reconciled unto him through the atonement of Christ, his only begotten Son, and ye may obtain a resurrection according to the power of the resurrection which is in Christ, and be presented at the first fruits of Christ unto God having faith and obtained a good hope and glory of glory in him, behold, he manifest, manifesteth himself in the flesh. I testify that Jesus Christ lives and we can minister to his and our fellow brothers and sisters by declaring the good word unto them. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Next week, we will discuss Jacob 5 through 7. Study up and we'll see you next week.